night where iron sharpens iron, where our worship arises and we touch heaven. So all of you, all of you out there, we ask that you stand and we ask that you join in with us and worship with all your heart.
whose love endures through generation. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses. Yes, you are. No one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same.
be our prayer tonight. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, amen, amen, church. Thank you so much for that worship. Come on, give them some praise. All right. I got me a new uh, iPad here, and we're going to use that bad boy. No, hey, uh, it's, a wonder and, uh, it's wonderful and an honor to be with you tonight, uh, worshiping Jesus. Um, I, uh, you know, I get the opportunity to come up and, you know, do greeting quite often, and it's an it's extreme honor. I'm so thankful and so honored to just be uh, here in God's house, let alone uh, welcoming uh, the church, uh, this body. And uh, I always, you know, when I get when I get approached about, you know, hey, you know, sometimes Pastor Tom will say, hey, you want to do, uh, you know, greeting? I say, man, absolutely. Or Pastor will ask, absolutely. Um, I always, it's an honor. I'm going to say that again, and it's an honor to be in God's house and to to worship with y'all. And, um, you know, I'm often uh, reading text. I'm a text guy. I'd really rather be a text guy than give you my opinion because my opinion is not very good some days. So I just feel like I'll tell you what God says. It's been around a lot longer than me, yeah? yeah. Been around a lot longer than us. So it's a little bit more valuable in my opinion. Uh, but I was, you know, I was reading about some of the, some of the first uh, miracles that Jesus did today. Um, and I would like to point out the first one, you know, about the, you know, the wedding or, the, or when he turned the water to wine. Uh, that's a big, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a conversation for the church. That goes all over the place about how it's okay for this and it's okay for that. But I want to give you something else to think about, just for a moment, if you're listening. Anybody here? Yes. Okay. All right. You see, that time on turning the water to wine was a whole lot different than what we see on a fermented drink. Because John was to never had fermented drink touch his lips, and he was paving the way for Jesus, what the text says, yes? Anybody with me? Yes. This is the church, right? We read the Bible. Amen. Amen. So that's a big conversation in the church. But let me, let me point this out to you just for a moment. I, and I don't care where you are in your walk or if this is your first time visiting with us. Honor. Great. Thank you. But if, 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 if I don't know where you're at in your walk, but some can come here for a long time and still be not further along than they need to be, but that's okay. God still loves you. But let me ask you this. If God didn't meet you where you are, how was you going to get to where he needs you to be? Okay, let's think about that in perspective. Because I always say this, proper perspective always equals reality. But the way that you perceive something is the way that you receive it. Yes? Okay. All right. We're getting somewhere. Pastor's bringing the word. I'm just going. I'm just going to give you something that I really, really try to drive home here. If 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 Jesus turned the water to wine, and they say that you bring out the best for last, they was already, whatever you want to call it, along in the process of drinking. I would say real wine because I don't really believe that Jesus turned this into wine. I believe he purified it, the best tasting anything that you could ever put in your lips. I believe that. But he met them right where they were. Right where he was. How many people have heard a story about Pastor Kenan's dad? It's one of those that comes to mind that his daddy said, hey, I'm done with this. I'm not in a, in a bar. Just laid it down and walked on out. Okay. Yeah. God met him right where he was, right where you're at. I don't care what you're going through or where you've been, but God will meet you right where you're at, and then you begin a process. And then you begin the process, but you have to believe it to receive it. Okay? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship you tonight, Father. Father, thank you for meeting us right where we're at. Father, in our struggles, in our needs, in our lacks, you're the fulfiller of all those, God. Father, we thank you for this house of worship. Father, we pray that your spirit would overwhelm and overtake and fill up and overflow this place, this sanctuary, your church tonight, God. Father, we pray that you would anoint our pastor as he brings the word that you have given to him in private, and he'll speak it publicly tonight. Father, we thank you for your word, for we believe it's true. 
We believe, it's, we believe it does anything that you said it would do. And it'll accomplish anything that needs to be done. Father, we believe off of one message, many years will hear something that they need. Father, we thank you for this opportunity and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Woo! Come on, man. Let's give him some praise. So, hey, if we got any first-time visitors, so welcome. If there's anybody watching with us online, thank you so much. Uh, like and say a whole lot of good things about the guy with the microphone right now. It's okay. <laughs> uh, we do have a connection card. Uh, we would ask that you fill that out to get a re record of your attendance. Uh, just basic information. Uh, pastors, uh, Kenan or Lori will reach out and, you know, um, welcome you to our church. And in the back is for a prayer request as well. And uh, we also have an a, a, a app. Uh, we, 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 we speak on that often. We have an app. You can download that app, and you can do all these things on the app. You can do your giving. You can do anything. You can see pastor's notes from Sunday. You can go back and watch old sermons. You can actually watch us live right now on the app. Wow, that's amazing. I got the app. <laughs> so download that. Uh, we're also going to just transition on into uh, our tithes and offering. So if you got, amen. If you got a seed you want to sow, please get it prepared. Uh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give back to you because you continually give us so much. Father, we praise your name and your heavenly realms. Father, we thank you for all that you do. Father, we pray that you would continue to use the seed that's sown here to further the kingdom. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give back in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. about my father just got up literally got up off a bar stool and uh, I, I was excited that he remembered that because like hey there's somebody that remembers something I said um, now I know you know we learn by repetition anybody say amen because I got saved when I was 17 see you you've learned that you've learned that because I say it like every week so we have to be repetitious sometimes in order to pick certain things up and and that's one thing that's beautiful about the Word of God, that each time we read it, even though it may be repetitious, there's something new, fresh, and alive that pops off the pages each and every time. Amen? And so we're continuing to walk through this 23rd Psalms, and we've all read it a, 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 
possibly hundreds of times. But each time I read it, there's a new life that comes to me through it. And so we're going we're gonna to walk into this just a little bit more. Uh, we're going to teach about verse 4 tonight of that 23rd Psalm. But why don't you stand to your feet tonight as we just read the 23rd Psalm in its entirety, which is six verses. But it, you know, we read it a lot of times in funerals and things like that because it brings comfort to us. But it really doesn't have anything to do with death. It has everything to do with life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want for anything. That he makes me to lie down because I'm confident in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters because when I walk with the Lord, there's not chaos in my life. He restores my soul. He strengthens me and he empowers me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness so that I walk honorably to his name for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, you are with me, O God. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and you are always more than enough, that your grace is always sufficient, and your mercies are new every morning. My cup runs over. So I know that I know that I know that I know that surely goodness and mercy will follow me, all the days of my life that I'm going to walk with an empowered Holy Ghost anointing upon my life that what I lay my hand to will be blessed that God goes before me in all things and then on that day whenever that day may be I will one day lay these things down in this life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because he loves me somebody say amen, amen. you may be seated so what do we learn in this Psalms 23 as we have walked through verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3 and and so now we we get into this this verse 4 yea though I walk through the valley of the the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you are with me O God your rod and your staff they comfort me what do we learn we learn that that we will fear no evil and so if we will fear no evil, then evil must absolutely be real. Now, I know, I know, I know. You would think that would, that would go without needing explanation. But there are so many that don't see the spiritual conflict that's all around us in life. They don't see it as a spiritual conflict. And that's why we have a people group and, and, and that are always wanting to legislate some kind of morality. They're trying to legislate more laws, trying to put in, in place things that actually then begin to supersede the laws of God that are already in place. You know the Ten Commandments are, are so simplistic. And that if we just lived by that and that alone, that there would be harmony in our world. We don't need, we don't need the, the umpteen tens of, literally tens of thousands of laws that are on the books. All we need is those ten. We see those 10, that then we would treat each other rightly, that we would treat with honor and respect, that there would be dignity in our midst. And so people forget that this is a, a spiritual conflict, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and against evil and wickedness in high places. So we learn that, that evil is real, but we do not have to be afraid of it. So we acknowledge the realness of evil, but we also then have to understand if evil is real, then the Bible says that you are the righteousness of Christ, therefore you are not evil. See, a lot of times people get this idea, and, and, and you've said it before, some of you have. Now listen to me, listen to pastor today. We say, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, 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 no. A sinner is evil. It's an enemy against God. But you're not a sinner that's been saved by grace. Either you've been saved by grace or you have not. All right? So if you've been saved by grace, the Bible says that you're not a sinner, that you are the righteousness of Christ. So you become the righteousness of Christ because of his grace and his mercy that is extended to you. 
So don't ever think that there's something wrong with you, that something's broken in you, that something... No, no, no. You are his prized creation. If you've been blood-bought, born again, if you are Bible-believing, if you're standing on the truth and the word of God, then you are not a sinner saved by grace. There is evil, and evil is real, but I don't feel it, fear it because I'm not evil. So if I'm not evil, then we really only have good and evil. We only really only have right and wrong. We have good and bad. I mean, that's so if if I'm not evil, then then I must be good. So I must be I must be good. And and God says that I'm an opposite of evil. So what happens is because you are light, the Bible says that you are light. So then if you are light, you're in conflict with darkness. So if you are light, then you and darkness cannot dwell in the same in the same vicinity. Because light, it doesn't curse darkness. It doesn't have to get mad at it. It doesn't have to throw a temper tantrum. It doesn't have to stomp around. It doesn't have to try to win an argument and show that I'm, I'm so much more light than you are. No, no, no. All light has to do is just be light and then darkness is driven away. See, that's where I think the church has, has forgot some things. And, and these are rudimental truths that, that we don't have to get mad and scream and yell and holler at darkness. We don't have to protest and have picket lines and everything else. And we, we don't, all we have to do is just be light. Just be light and, and light dispels darkness. What's something else that we learn here that, that, that evil is real, but I don't have to fear it? And the one reason I don't have to fear it because I'm the opposite of it, and I'm the opposite of it, so that makes me above it. Now, now listen to me. I'm not saying that I'm better than someone else. Paul said uh, of sinners who I'm, I'm probably one of the worst. Not saying that I'm better than someone else, that, you know, I'm above something else, that I'm, no, no, no. I'm just saying that God proclaims me as his righteousness, therefore I don't have to fear evil because he is elevated in me above that. See, if we undee devil, undee devil, then what do we have left? We have evil. So the devil, if we undee him, is simply evil. Jesus spoke about it to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and those. Now, now listen, this is the religious hierarchy of the day that he's speaking to. <laughs> the church establishment. Sometimes we think, well, I'm a member of such and such church. Well, good for you. Jesus hated all those people. Okay, okay, hate's a strong word. But here's what he said about them. He said, you're of your father, the devil. And if we undo the devil, you're evil. And the desires of your father is what you want to do, evil things. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resource. The Bible says, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth proclaims. For he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. And he says that you are of him. Now, that's pretty strong. And so I never want to be religious. I want to be in a relationship. I want to walk as the righteousness of Christ be, being not evil, but not because of my good, because my good is this filthy rags. I mean, the very best, the very, very best that I can do is, is, is filthy and dirty rags. That's the very best that I can do. That's, that's the best that I can do. Like, my wife gives me what I, what I use as shop towels. Uh, you know, I don't go buy, you know, shop towels as shop towels. I, I get all the hand-me-downs from the kitchen towels. And I usually get the hand-me-downs from the kitchen towels because I've used the kitchen towel to wipe a motorcycle off or to clean my boot or to do something. And, and then what happens is, you know, that, that, that nice towel, that white towel or whatever, kind of becomes a little bit dingy even when you wash it. You wash it and you know it's clean, right? Right? You know it's clean, but it just looks dirty. 
So you can scrub yourself all up and you can try to dress yourself up and you can get baptized and you can do all kinds of religious things. But the reality of it is not only will you still look dingy, you will still be dingy because the very best you can do, the very best you can do is, is, is you become a shop towel because you, you're not going to fit in the kitchen anymore. Okay? So that's the best we can do. So it's his righteousness that is imputed to us. That washes me then, that washes me then whiter than snow. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, you're from God, it says, little children, and have, have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So now all of a sudden I realize that I am the righteousness of Christ because greater is he who is in me than he that's in the world. So I fear no evil because fear becomes contrary to the very nature that I am. It's the opposite of who I am. It's I no longer have fear in my nature. So in my nature, because he's given me a new nature, he's given me a new mind, so I can't resonate of the things of old, so therefore I will not be afraid. I will fear no evil because, because my nature now is contrary to evil. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to, to be sin who knew no sin, that we might then become his righteousness or the righteousness of God. So he's given me a new nature. Paul writes in Romans 7, 5, when we were living in the flesh, we're trapped by the things of the flesh, we're embodied in this thing of the flesh, the sinful passions of the flesh, all of these things, which were awakened by which the law then identifies all these things as sin. Paul said, I didn't know some of these things were sin until the law tells me that these things are sin because they were part of my nature. And they were at work at the body that bears in the fruit, the fruit of death. Since the willingness to sin leads to death and separation from God. This is word of God, people. But then Paul helps us sin in the church of Philippi as he writes a letter in, in Philippians 2, 5. He said, let this mind now then be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So now I have a new mind that is placed in me that gives me a new nature so I no longer now walk in the sinful deeds of the flesh because I make a conscious choice. Everybody say choice. I make a choice to try to live above sin because I don't fear evil because I'm not evil. I'm the opposite of evil. I'm the righteousness of Christ. Now, listen to me. I'm not saying that I don't ever do something wrong. I'm certainly not saying that you'd ever do anything wrong. Because if you want to sit down, I got a list. So it's not that we never make a mistake, but listen to me. It is an impossibility, it is absolutely impossibility for you to sin if you walk in the Spirit. You can't sin. The only time you can sin is when you step out of the Spirit into the flesh. So what I have to try to do is I have to try to stay in the spirit. Now, that's not easy. It all depends about who you hang around with or who bumps into you that day, too, because there are certain people that can bring you right back into the flesh really quickly. Driving Houston traffic, you know, bring you right back into the flesh real quick. Hey, there's a great awakening that happens. The old man claws himself right out of that grave. I know nobody here knows what I'm talking about, but there might be somebody that watching that does. I always, I always caution people and tell them, I, listen, don't push me real hard because I'm not that saved. All right? Pastor Richard told me one time he, he had a new anointing upon his life. He's going to open up a slapping ministry. Because some people, you just need to slap them. You know, you just need a slapping. And, uh, you know, so with that, I just developed a, an open up a can ministry and Because sometimes, you know, some people, they just need a can. That's what they need, just a can open. 
And uh, uh, it was funny. I had one of our guys, uh, somebody uh, sent me a whatever on one of their social medias or something, whatever that is, sent me a copy of, of what I'm had posted. As Pastor Keenan always used to say, I'm like, oh, man, out of all the things I've said, that's what you remember? <laughs> oh. So our relationship then with the shepherd, it changes things. It changes what we were once afraid of so that we're afraid no more. All of a sudden, I, you know, I, I don't fear death anymore. I don't know if anybody's ever been afraid of death, but I never really wanted, wanted to, to meet it. But I don't fear it anymore. I don't fear death because I, I know that I know that I know that Jesus holds the keys. I don't fear challenges or turmoil or trouble because I know that somehow, even when I, and, I, and I've been in this thing long enough to know that, that somehow he walks with me through it. Because there's only an into when there was an out of. I don't fear the shadows if I walk through the shadow of, I don't fear the shadows because he is light, therefore he says that I am light, and light dissipates darkness, so it drives shadows away. If you're ever carrying a lantern, and the word of God says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway, that, that as you carry a lantern, there's always shadows out in front of you. Whatever you're carrying, there's shadows out in front of you, but as you get to them, they disappear because you have the source of the light. So as the light comes into them, those shadows, so you don't have to fear what's way out there because by the time you get to what's way out there, what's way out there now is way out there because that light dissipates those shadows. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. And then gives this great practical piece of advice. Because you're no longer darkness, but now you're light. So walk as children of light. Gosh, what a, just a practical application of the word of God. Me and Pastor Richard was talking, and, and I believe Tony Evans, and, and I, I'm going to share one of my Tony Evans stories. Do you, anybody remember back when cell phones were brand new, and you had to, like, buy them by the minute? And then you bought plans, like you had, like, I got 250 minutes. Really, dude? I got 350, you know? And does anybody remember those days? And then, like, for every minute after that, it was like, like a gallon of gas. I mean, it was like $72. You know, for every minute after that. And I was, I, was, I was on TBN, and we were doing a big national TV program, and Tony Evans was there with me, and he's walking around, and he don't have a cell phone. And I thought, hey, I'm a pretty big deal. I got a cell phone. Tony Evans don't even have a cell phone. But I found out he was actually much smarter than me, that he probably had one, but he doesn't carry it. That way he can ask somebody like me, hey, can I borrow your cell phone? And I'll think I'm important by, like, I'm giving Tony Evans a cell phone. An hour later, he walks back still on my cell phone. <laughs> he tells a story, Pastor Richard just shared it to me, like you go to a restaurant and you, and you, you look at the menu and you, you know, read up and down. And, and even if you've been at that restaurant before, you still read up and down it, you know. And then, you know, what's the special for the day? And then you ask the, 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 the waiter or waitress, whatever the case may be, the wait staff, you ask them, you know, now what exactly is the special? How's that made? Is that, you know, is that this or is it that? And they tell you all about it and everything. And, and then, th then you just fold up the menu and you walk out and you never partake of anything. That's normally not what you do because everything looks so good. It looks so wonderful. You really want part of it. You're, you know, as, as he's explaining it, your, your saliva is, is, is working at it, you know, and everything. And you're just like, you know, salivating and you're just, you're ready to eat. But yet we come to church and we do that all the time. And, and we see the great anointing of God that, that flows from the throne room of heaven and, and then we just leave. Because information without application becomes of no effect. And that's why, I, you know, I'm an altar guy. I, I'm just, I'm going to tell you, I, I just think like at worship times, I, Bobby, I, did, I didn't tell you, I told Marcia before service, like 
when we have our early service on Sunday mornings and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching at that and I'm getting done with that and I'm getting into this service, I always make sure I have my phone on and I'm watching it, this service, because it usually starts right before I get here. And, and I always look and Bobby's up here worshiping so I know it's going to be a good day because I see him up around the altar worshiping. And I'm just a worship guy. I just think, man, we ought to bombard the altars. I mean, I think, I think just the altars should be filled with people and prayer warriors around the altar, not because somebody said, hey, uh, come up and we'll pray. And No, 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 because I can't. There is a proximity blessing that I want to get to. I, I don't want to stay at a distance. I want to get up. My, my father-in-law uses his terms, and, and Lori, when I said that, she already knows what I'm going to say, is get under the spout where the glory comes out. I go to Pastor Mike's church and 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 I get up and I and I I get in his on his on the platform right up by where he is. Just before security comes and pulls me away. And because I, I want to get up, I want to get up by where it's happening at. I, I want to get up, I want to get up and I want to get as close to that flow as I can. I, I want to feel that presence and that anointing that 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 we once were, were, were in darkness, but now we're light. So I want to I want to walk in the light. I want to walk in the light. I want to partake of everything that God has. See what happens is when we talk about the enemy, Satan. Satan actually translate. It really means adversary. So the devil, Satan, our adversary. And, and Jesus speaks to the mission that he's on in John 10.10. 10, says that the, the thief, the adversary, has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, to disrupt and bring chaos into lives. So the enemy of God desires to attack the Lord. And, and since he can't directly attack the Lord, what he does is he goes to and fro. And he, he's trying to attack the Lord by getting to you. And causing you to be less than the purpose of the fullness of the potential that God already has for you. Because God's already dreamed a dream in you. Now, if you're going to come to church and, and, and you know, okay, you, hey, I'm saved. I, I don't, I, I'm not going to hell. I'm saved. Well, okay, you know, the enemy can swallow that pill if he can just keep you ineffective for the kingdom. And so we stay ineffective for the kingdom because we don't get under the spout where the glory comes out and we come in and we look at the menu and we get it explained to us and we walk through all those things, but we don't really assimilate it into us. And so if you want to become spiritually healthy, <laughs> some of the guys were, were chiding me earlier. And, and they, were, they, were, they were asking me, because I posted something on my, my, whatever that Facebook thing or whatever, that, that I posted a picture of that. It was when I was doing a, a Walker, Texas Ranger program with my good friend, Chuck Norris. And, and uh, we were doing a program, and he said, hey, that wasn't you on there. That guy was a lot bigger. That's what they said. That guy was, he was bigger. That, that, that can't be you. That, he, was, he, was, he was bigger. <laughs> Hurt my feelings. <laughs> but if the enemy can get to you and make you not feel as big as you are in God, then he can stunt the potential that God has in you. And then that'll keep you from witnessing to your husband or to your wife or to your kids or to your parents or to your coworkers or anywhere else because you don't feel that you're quite, I mean, who am I to be telling, you know, I'm not where they think I'm going to think I'm some goody two-shoe and everything. And I'm, I'm some, I'm, I know, so I'll just, I'll just go to church, keep it to myself, love God, not tell anyone else, and, and, and lose the fullness of the potential of the purpose that he has for me. I'll live life, just not life abundantly. I'll miss out on those things. And if the enemy can, can dupe you into that, 
Now, Paul is speaking in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He's speaking about forgiveness and how we have to be willing to walk in forgiveness and how we have to have, uh, be mercy motivated and forgiveness driven. And, and he says this in, in, in verse 11, chapter 2, 2 Corinthians. Lest Satan should take advantage of you because we're ignorant of his devices. And what he's talking about is if we walk in unforgiveness, the enemy takes advantage of us because we don't realize that that is a device of the enemy to walk around in bitterness and unforgiveness that then causes the Lord not to be able to forgive us. So that's why we walk around shame-driven instead of mercy-motivated. And then we think that we're inadequate to share the light of Christ to a world around us because we ourselves are not worthy of that light. Well, you don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand the mistakes I've made. You don't understand what this is. or You don't understand what that is. You know what? I, I don't, it doesn't even matter if I understand it or not. He does. So I'm not going to fear Satan just like I'm not going to fear poisonous snakes. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not. I know what they're capable of so I don't mishandle them. I don't handle them. Now, I did when I first moved to Texas. There's this beautiful, beautiful red and black and yellow snake crawling through my yard. He's about this long, you know. And, and I used to, you know, so I run over and I catch him and pick him up. And, and uh, I thought, man, this is really a pretty snake. And so I called a local pet store. And they said, and they asked me to describe it. And so I described it to them. They said, you didn't touch it, did you? <laughs> Um, uh, um, because if it bites you, you probably won't even make it to a hospital. I'm like, yeah, no, I didn't touch it. Um, so I don't fear the enemy because I know what he's capable of. And I may be this or that, but I ain't no match for him. We talk about an angelic being. I, I, you know, I mean, I hear people, come on, devil, hit me with your back. What? Shut up. Because if you're going to try to take this thing on on your own, see, I, I fear no evil because, God, you are with me. So I don't have to fight that battle. I don't have to be the one that's, I don't have to do, because greater is he than me. In Jude, verse 9. But even the archangel, Michael, the archangel, Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, Satan, and arguing about the body of Moses, he did not dare bring abusive condemnation against Satan, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, Michael, the archangel, is not going to pick a fight with Satan himself. <laughs> Who do you think you are? So he simply said, the Lord rebuke you. So I got to realize, listen, if it was me, I'd fear evil. It'd just be elbows and hind ends. Or however that saying goes. That's all, I mean, but it's not. It's Christ in me that because of my hope of glory. That's why I have no fear. Everybody say no fear. In 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what? Love, power, sound mind. See, my, my spirit man is not made for fear. The flesh man, it's a different story. Spirit man is not, not made for fear. Why? Because my spirit man understands, God, that you are with me. I will fear no evil because you are with me. Now, this is the same spirit that David approached the giant from Gath. 
And he pointed his finger at him. And he said, the battle is not mine. But it's the Lord's. Because Goliath looked at him and he said, what am I, a dog that you come to me, a, a little boy with sticks and stones and staffs and you, you coming at me, I, I'm a seasoned man of war. And he said, I'm going to rip your body apart and feed the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And he said, they're going to eat today, but it'll not be me, it'll be you because the battle is not about me. I'm not representing me here today, but the battle is the Lord's. It's kind of like when you were, you were kids. I know you remember the old saying, you know, that, you know, I don't know if you, 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 you had a dad in this line or if you had a big brother or whatever, but you're always looking for whoever you got that's connected to you could beat up the bully that was picking on you. So you'd have that, you know, my dad's could beat up your dad. You know, my, we had those, that idea. So it's, it's never been about you. It's been about what you have that's bigger and badder and better than you. See, God's made me to walk in victory, not defeat. However, victory only comes if there is a battle. So there has to be a battle in order for there to be victory. But battles cannot scare you because you have to know who's on your side. Otherwise, man, we would walk in fear. But the Word of God tells me that I don't have to. Jesus said, John 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. He said, I'm a good shepherd. I'm a good shepherd, and I, a good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. So I fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, it's not, it's not only with me, but it's ready to battle for me. It's not only with me, but he's ready to battle for me. And if you're not totally comfortable in this world that we walk in and everything else that's because this world is not your home so you should always walk with a certain uncomfortableness about you because the enemy is as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour but I'm not fearful of that because he's with me and his rod and his staff they bring great assurance to my life some assume a rod and a staff are the same but they are not the rod is a weapon, a weapon to beat off the wolf, to beat off the bear, to, 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 to beat the thief, to protect you against any negative attacks that could come your way. The staff then, the, the, the rod is that negative, the staff is that positive, that positive tool that's used for, for walking, it's used for, for pointing, correcting, instructing, also used to leverage, to lift, it's used for leading. Now, historically, these tools would have been spoken of as battling and building. So the rod is a battle, the staff is a building. So I'm going to use the, the rod for battle, I'm going to use the staff to build. Historically, that's what it would have been seen as, or that would have been some of the verbiage that it would be used as. So when we use the word comfort, what's some things that come to mind? With some of this heat we've been having, air conditioning, something that comes to my mind, comfort. Or maybe it's that, that big easy chair. Or maybe it's that curling up on the couch. My, my wife likes to do that with a blanket. She always has a little blanket folded up on the couch that she'll throw over her feet and her legs. And, and then she'll kick her feet out and say, rub my feet. When we think of that comfort, the, the original language in, in this word comfort actually means, listen to me, actually means help. So thy rod and thy staff, they help me. They help me. They help me battle and they help me build. They help me battle and they help me build. So if we look at the psalmist and what he's actually saying, uh, we have to think of cause and effect. So I will fear no evil, cause and effect, because you are with me. 
thy rod and thy staff, the battle and the builder, they help me cause and effect. So the rod helps me to feel safe. The staff helps me to feel assured. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father that he will give another helper, listen to me, a helper to you that will abide with you forever. And then that spirit of truth who the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor does it know him, but you know him for he dwells within you and will be or dwells with you and will be in you. So thy rod and thy staff, the battle and the builder, they comfort, they help me, that he will send a comforter that will help us, a comforter that will help us. So a helper is the one that comes along then beside you. The comforter is there in the good or in the bad. He's there. So the Holy Spirit leads us in truth, and truth always bears witness with truth. Truth always bears witness with truth. So then that helper gives us the ability to walk in the things of the Spirit and not in the flesh, but you could not do this on your own. So thy rod and thy staff, the battle and the builder that are the comfort, the helper, the helper that helps me to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. It is the completion of the fullness of the spirit that allows me to walk in the boldness and the righteousness of God, which gives us the empowerment to speak the word of God with great boldness. And he made the righteous as bold as lions. So we have a parallel now that we see in the word of God that the psalmist is unfolding here, that the rod and the staff that comforts and helps us because Jesus sends the comforter, the helper, the convictions of sin, that protects us from evil, that guides us, that moves in intercessory prayer in and through us, that gives us in the ability to have the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. Jesus told Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Who do you say that I am? Well, some say you're this, some say you're that. But who do you say? I say that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And and he's flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven has revealed this, that this has been made known to you by the Spirit. Now, if we look at historically uh, the rod, it tells us that, that, that in Numbers chapter 17 that it speaks of family genealogy. It speaks of the sons of Israel obtained from them the staff, excuse me, not the rod, the staff for which each father's household, the 12 staffs of the leaders of the father's households, their names are written on the staff. And so it became, if you would, a family tree. He who abides and holds his rod, then it says, hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. So the rod has always been for that battle of wickedness, sin that abides in us, and the staff has been that which speaks of our longevity and our lineage in Christ. That the curse will follow the third and the fourth generation, but the blessings of God will follow a thousand generations. The psalmist writes in 89, then I will punish their wrongdoing with the staff and their guilt with afflictions. But I will not withhold my favor from him, nor deal falsely in my faithfulness. Because the rod has always been a standard of of correction. What do you desire, 1 Corinthians 4.21? That I come to you with a rod, or that I come to you with love and the spirit of gentleness? He said, I will not withhold my faithfulness. The staff used for care, guidance, rescue... The staff also used to divide the healthy from the unhealthy. The staff used to to separate in those areas to assist in the path of our walk. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men from us to go out and to fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on top of a hill and 
And I'll be there with my, my staff, the staff of God in my hand, that will carry the, the genealogy and the lineage. And Joshua did as Moses had told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it came about when Moses held his hands up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. And Moses' hands became heavy. Listen to me. So they took a stone and they put under him. And they set him on it. And then Aaron and Hur, they held his hands. I said, they held his hands with the staff, with the body of Christ, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands, when they grew heavy, they stayed steady until the sun went down. And Joshua defeated Amalek. And his people with the edge of the sword because there were those that were willing to hold the hands. I will fear no evil. God, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They help me. They help me to battle. and They help me to build discerns the hearts and the thoughts, the intent of me. That it challenges and it encourages as we look at the history. I spent some time these last week walking through some of this and I thought about the worship that has ascended to the heavens, the staff that's been held high, and the lineage that becomes written on it. Of Bill Atkins singing songs unto the heavens. Of Jake and Vasti Atkins filling in that gap and worshiping ascending unto heaven. Jonathan Rangel, worshiping, ascending unto heaven. Chandel along, worshiping, a pure and a holy God ascending unto heaven. David Valadez, worshiping and ascending unto heaven. A myriad of musicians and vocalists coming together in a beautiful symphony of worship Ascending unto heaven. And I see the staff that's held high. It's engraved with the names of the body. That when it's held up and it becomes heavy, that others will always rally around and help hold in whatever needs to be done. So I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The pastoral staff that has come through the years and the history of this church, there's a richness there. There's a fullness there that God has engraved every name. Thy rod and thy staff, help me. They comfort me. They battle for me and they build for me. So I don't worry about anything because he's with me. Stand to your feet tonight. I'm going to close this in prayer. We're just going to worship for a moment and if you'd like to and again I believe in that proximity blessing. You just want to stand around the altar and just thank God for the richness of the heritage that he's given us. The fullness of the merit of his favor that's upon us. I was talking with another pastor and we're talking about the, those that have come through the body. We start sharing names that go way back.
some that have moved, relocated, some that have went to be with Jesus, some that have, and I thought about that, that staff that builds because each one builds upon another one that builds upon another one that builds. The rod that battles so I don't have to, so you don't have to. I will fear no evil because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comp they help, they comfort, they battle, they build. Lord Jesus, bless your people. Thank you, O oh God, for the fullness of your word that enriches our spirit, that transforms our life. That God, we leave more and more like you each and every moment of each and every day. That we realize the, the wealth that you've built in us and through us. That God, you continue to write our story. you help us, that you battle, that you build with us, and so we do not have a spirit of fear, but of power, love, joy, and a sound mind, in Jesus' name, amen. We're just going to worship for a few moments, if you want to just spend a few moments, if you want to spend a little bit of time around the altar, if you want to just, I just get under that spout where the glory comes out. It's what, it's, it's what I love. God bless y'all. We love y'all so very, very much. You are all awesome. God bless you.